Good evening, guys. Kenneth Tortoise Capital. This is the Creativity 202 True Story Session for Lesson 19, entitled Twister. We're looking at conflicts inside the organization, we've determined. <laughs> and uh, it's October 31st, Halloween. Boo. And uh, we're going to add uh, Luke's video into this afterwards. So you got another homework assignment to to review. He's got it loaded in Slack, and I've been monkeying around trying to get a hold of it. But I will get it added to the lesson. Uh, so uh, let's do a quick check-in with uh, Dan and Bill, see how you guys are doing. Dan, what's up? Well, um, it was a pretty uh, exciting weekend. Um, we had um, my son's wedding on Friday night. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, that was a big deal. And then on Saturday, uh, my mother-in-law and uh, sister-in-law were here visiting, and they both had their birthdays. So we had a big uh, birthday party. Well, a dozen people, which is a big party for us to have. And uh, uh, so just uh, dealing with that. And then to top it off, a completely um, unrelated. Um, family emergency came up uh, on Sunday, which uh, uh, all turned out okay. But the uh, upshot of it was that I basically lost two days and all the balls from the trading courses and trading activities that I'm doing came crashing to the earth. And I now need to uh, start figuring out how to juggle again this week. Uh, but it's all good. You know, uh, we're, we're healthy, we're happy. Uh, the uh, marriage is uh, consummated. I uh, got a granddaughter on the way, and um, all very exciting. And my uh, mother-in-law sold her house in, in Kansas, in, in in Lawrence, Kansas. Oh, probably there. Good deal. However, the inspector, the inspection turned up some foundation issues. So, more that's more you, excitement to like come. To the only thing better than foundations <laughs> is termites. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, brother, how are you doing? Uh, doing good. I, uh, just a very, it's interesting how quickly, uh, to me, how quickly things go from, uh, planning phases and anticipated, uh, accelerations just like take off and, and go screaming down the track, uh, like Casey, the engineer, just, yeah, just, okay, one, two, ten. That vacuum tunnel. <laughs> yeah. Just, so that's, uh, that's a nice problem to have. Um, just uh, keeping the, looking for the next signal and, and the, the light in the tunnel ahead, I just hope isn't another train. Yeah. Nah, it'll be all right. We're, it's, like I said, good problems to have. I hope. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good here. I was able to solve a problem with a uh, combination of writer's block, which was coming from a imposter syndrome. You know, I'm working on this um, uh, leadership project with the, with the Danes, my Danish Viking friends over there. One of them's the head of their, just retired as the head of their FBI. And... Uh, the his partner, the guy who recruited him into this, is uh, Jens Larsen, who's a uh, one of the co-writers of the True Storytelling Handbook with Boji. Uh, but he's also the guy that helped their Danish philosopher Ole Phil Kirkeby modernize Aristotle's coaching from ancient Greece and Athens and what they used to develop the philosopher kings. So they developed a particular style of coaching that is quite unlike any other coaching that you see in the modern world. It's not prescriptive. It's not therapeutic. Uh, it's not designed with an end in mind. It's really, it's an agreement to engage an open-ended dialogue about whatever the client wants to talk about and puts on the table. And through a series of questions and different angles, you try to help them shed light on what seems to be important to them. 
without any particular goal in mind for improvement or whatever. It's just really just you're helping them examine this knotted storyline or this web of words that they've created that they want to examine. So it's it's kind of non-denominational in that sense. It's not like athletic performance coaching where there's a real skill that I'm trying to develop. Here, here's how you improve your first touch in soccer. You know, Here's how you take a penalty kick. And it's not executive coaching, which is sort of follows an MBA style, how to be an effective executive inside a major corporation um, with traditional leadership skills and qualities. And it's not sort of like uh, denominational life coaching in which you're trying to help the acolyte acquire like certification in the skills of revealed knowledge. So all those are sort of recognized models of coaching and the International Coaching Federation, ICF, has a pretty good curriculum on how to do that kind of executive coaching and then there's coaching for, you know, whatever life coaching means, you know, I guess. Well, protreptic isn't like any of those things. So anyway, I got those two Danish Vikings. Uh, we've talked ourselves into this uh, leadership dialogue with the intention of looking at case studies from Jens Hendrik Koiberg's 40-plus year career as Denmark's top cop and uh, lawyer representative to the International Committee on Anti-Terrorism for the UN, representing Denmark, as he's being coached by Jens Larsen. And Angus Fletcher, world-class creativity guy and literature expert and story science guy, is looking at my case studies to interview me about my lessons of leadership of 45 years in Department of Defense. So each of us is uh, me and then Jens Hoiberg are putting on five case studies of leadership from our careers. And I read the first couple that he wrote. I'm thinking, Jesus, gee whiz. Uh, and so I was trying to come up with something of similar magnitude, you know, something deep and useful to people who want to read. And I was running into kind of a uh, writer's block from imposter syndrome. And then I just, you know, I had been invited to come give a speech on Veterans Day to some to one of the local high schools. And I was trying to think about what I wanted to tell them about uh, 45 years of lessons that I've learned. And it was about, I clarified it uh, about our sergeants. And, and so last night I was able to just kind of dictate about 10 pages of case study right off the bat. It was pretty good. Well, it turns out that that was exactly what one of my officers needed because she was running into some challenges academically in the course and is probably not going to earn her master's degree from the no. college but still have to participate and attend the rest of the classes and go through the whole school year, do all the work that everybody else is, but she doesn't get a master's degree when she's done. She gets the highly coveted certificate of attendance and thanks for your interest in national defense, uh, which is pretty thin gruel. So we were just talking, some of the lessons that I was writing about, you know, about how to deal with despair and, and uh, existential moments in your career, turned out to be exactly what it was that she needed to hear. So things come around at just the right time. Um, and stories have, you know, multiple purposes. Once you've written them, you have an artifact that sort of uh, is something that you can leverage. So that, that kind of just reinforced what I've been discovering about um, artifacts and true storytelling. So uh, it was a real relief to get through that because I've been sweating that for a couple of weeks. I'm feeling like I'm letting the team down and all that. Uh, and I had the stories inside me. I just couldn't bring myself to man up and just write them but I got broke the broke through the barrier on that uh, last night um, yeah otherwise things are going pretty good out here in Kansas cold weather's upon us and so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move us into the um, sacred space and listen to what you guys got on uh, lesson 19 conflicts at work and uh, the twister
just gonna oh, yeah. it came to me in a flash so i'm just gonna go with it um <clears throat> historical battle that never uh this is exercise two uh little little background my father was one of the uh the guys during the McCarthy era, uh, one of only two enlisted men ever to be accepted into the nuclear weapons development program. Um, his uh, cultural indoctrination to that was, in fact, World War II. Uh, his brothers had just finished helping win the war in Europe. Uh, just very... Uh, gentle gent the gentleman uh if you ever if you ever had the honor of meeting him uh but ferocious warriors both r.i.p uh one was a belly and tail gunner in the in the fortresses flying fortresses uh the other uh, I, I i don't remember his particular i just know that that they were both uh, there he was a marine the Marine. Yeah, fought at Iwo Jima. <laughs> so they both they both came home uh from and then and then had to be get ready to ship ship out and and uh my you know they then they dropped the bombs and the cultures that were there is the cultures that were involved, the US was still pretty upset about the surprise attack maybe looking for a little bit of payback, but they also had to consider that this would be the time that the Japanese would be fighting for their homeland, much like the giant determined, uh, deterrent it is in the U.S. You know, we've never, we've had a little bit, but uh, that, I, I got to believe that's a huge deterrent for people to ever attack the U.S. because the, the culture of we would be fighting for our own, our home. Uh, ground and they saw what we did to each other in the civil war and maybe that has deterred a lot of people um anyway uh so that was kind of the big thing is the, is is the culture and the personality but then the technology um you know they there were some guys these things were relative basically untested weapons that they were going to drop on nagasaki and hiroshima uh, some of the scientists there were like, hey, you you might vaporize the entire planet if you do this. It might trigger a chain reaction that just kills everybody. Um, so that's some of the personalities. And then you had, uh, you know, the the guys that were flying on the Enola Gay. Uh, just they're like, well, you know, if we're going to end up saving millions of lives by taking 50 and 60,000 we've got we've got to do that uh no matter how horrible that is um so imagining the second part of this is after identifying identifying the law of uh one of my heroes what he, Patton said you know you have to make war so awful that people never want to do it again um, and I think he was right. And I think that was part of what went into this as well. Um, it's three un so my imagined three unexpected consequences is that we don't drop those weapons. Japan, I would think, ends up uh taking over most of the Pacific on that side of the Pacific Rim and then subjugating like everything down to Taiwan because because China wasn't really ready. They had the big manpower, but technologically I don't think that they were ready to to battle that. Certainly Taiwan and 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 maybe they even get involved in Korea. So Japan could be as big as Russia is today and China. Um, except they would have tons of resources now. Uh, so that's one thing. And that could, that could absolutely change the, 
we we may have stopped the war for a bit, but um, they were fantastic at 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 manufacturing and everything too. And imagine if they started lending, uh, doing what the land lease like we had done with the rest of Europe, but then they do it with China and everybody on that side. You know, maybe maybe they apply that into a a, a union with the Soviets. Maybe the U.S. is in here. I don't know. So that could be an unexpected consequence. Uh, the thing does, well, the, the other one was, yeah, it does vaporize the planet, and we don't, we're not talking right now. Could have been. Didn't happen. Um, I don't know if I'm going to come up with a third one. But it was always, uh, to, br to bring it back home, uh, personally, talking with my dad at the end of his at the end of his time here on the planet he said he never ever forgot uh they made them watch the uh the vaporization of an island by one of the nuclear weapons um that had gone array uh, uh, awry a little bit uh in one of their ex experimental detonations and they made them watch that detonation when they first got there and when they left so they would always remember the the gravity of what it is that they were working on uh, so i hope that suffices for for tonight uh aho As I, as I mentioned during uh, the intro, the, I kind of had a um, bit of a, well, four days uh, going up in smoke as far as all of my trading and uh, uh, trading education sessions. But I did get a look at this um, lesson, exercise, lesson 19, and I had some thoughts about it. They're not really complete, but I'll uh, talk about them and then I'll talk a little bit about my work in progress. Um, so uh, I really liked uh, the way that uh, in this lesson, uh, you look for those plot twists and the, uh, the dynamics and the assumptions and the unexpected uh, consequences that could occur. Um, I'm not exactly clear on um, what kinds of unexpected consequences to look for, whether it's things that could have happened differently, or I guess if you assume the the weather did something or the culture did something, what could have happened differently than actually happened. Um, uh, so as I said, my, my work's not complete, but um, I definitely want to come back and uh, work on this one and, and so many of these um, later. It's one of these uh, courses where I think, uh, you do as much as you can along the way, but uh, there's a lot more uh, to explore, such as watching those Euro sessions that I don't really have time to watch along the way, but I'm squirreling them away for future uh, reference. Um, I'll be doing home study on this for a while. Anyways, the exercise about workspace conflict uh, reminded me of one that uh, I had when I was running uh, the consulting group at a little company called uh, Burton Group uh, that was bought by the research and advisory service Gartner Inc. eventually. Uh, and I was running the consulting group and uh, we had people doing research and people doing consulting and we were supposed to cross fertilize. And uh, when we went out and did consulting on um, identity management, digital identity management was mainly what we did at the time. Uh, 
and, and on security, cybersecurity, uh, there were a lot of vendors that we needed to keep track of. So I would, um, when, when I did the briefings with the vendors where they would tell me about these new products and they're always changing and, uh, you know, kind of inventing new uh, approaches to the technology, new standards, new ways of practices and things. Uh, um, I like to, um, to, to have notes on those briefings and share them with everybody uh, because I figured that would help us do better delivery with our customers. So I worked with one of my other consultants and we created a structured format that these notes could be taken in in a kind of a text database where we could keep them. And I did a meeting, you know, saying, well, I want you all, you know, when you do these briefings, when you do a job and you have to do a briefing with a vendor or you're just interested in a vendor and you do a briefing with them, I want you to put these notes in there. Uh, but the problem was uh, nobody but myself um, and, and, and one other person occasionally would do it and the other five or six people on the team wouldn't do it. So, uh, and, and um, although um, at one meeting afterwards, I ranted and raved a bit uh, and I got a few notes coming in, they still wouldn't do it. So why was it? Was it that people didn't want to collaborate, that people didn't like to take notes? Uh, what was it? I never did know, but when I did this exercise, I thought maybe the reason was uh, the unspoken assumptions about this team. And the unspoken assumption or the, the assumption of this team uh, that um, would support their position for not doing the notes was that um, my primary job as a consultant is to deliver billable work and keep the client happy. You know, and anything else is uh, gravy. You know, I, I shouldn't have to do a lot of uh, administrivia, you know, because that could take away from my billable work. And then another uh, big assumption, though, that I think was in my mind was, oh, that is all true. Uh, but we are a IT research and advisory company primarily that does consulting. And so it's important for the research to be getting um, good information, leverageable information from consulting, because when we sell this company, what's really going to create the most value uh, is uh, the research business. The consulting business only exists to generate uh, revenue to help bootstrap our research business, basically, and to keep our customers happy because they, they, they read our research and then they come and ask us, how do we do this? And that's what the consultants can tell them. So, um, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe there would have been a way that I could have um, uh, sold um, that better to the consultants, or maybe I could have um, gotten some of the researchers to um, participate more, uh, you know, in putting notes into this database and, uh, and then consulting could have leveraged those and maybe there would have been a little bit of a, you know, peer pressure to do more. Uh, so that, that was interesting. Um, the second exercise to think of a battle and how the environment, the culture, the weather, and all these other things affected the way it was thought. Um, well, I, I'm always fascinated by old English history. And I like to read about the Saxons and the Normans, you know, that had the great battle of Hastings. And then, um, eventually the Saxons, uh, and the Saxons were already kind of assimilated with the Danes because the Danes had invaded England um, in the eighth and ninth century and, and they'd taken about half of England. It was called Dane law. And uh, so by the time of the Norman invasion in 1066, uh, England was really Saxon and Danish. It, calling it Anglo-Saxon was kind of an old uh, <laughs> mingling from a set of invasions and wars. And the real, uh, the real ethnic uh, makeup there was Saxon Dane. Um, anyway, they liked to fight in a shield wall and they mostly fought on foot. And they did have archers. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't all that great at it. And now the Normans were another kind of mixture uh, that was very interesting because they came from uh, Vikings, Norse, Norway, and 
Norwegians and Danes that had invaded uh, France and had conquered the Duchy of Normandy. And then they mingled with the uh, French. And so by the 11th century, they were speaking Norman French, not, you know, you know, the Viking language anymore. And they were Christian, just like the Danes in England were Christian by then. And they, uh, but the, the main change that they'd had, they still had, um, their blood still ran fierce with the, uh, uh, the, the, the warrior blood of the Vikings, but uh, they'd also learned to be uh, mounted Vikings that rode around on horses. And uh, they, uh, so you have this, these two cultures coming together in this big battle of Hastings in 1066, Saxons, Danes, and Norman French, and the Norman French are mounted, and the Saxons, Danes are in a shield wall, uh, and their house carls, who were the uh, the you know the professional warriors, the full time warriors that worked for their uh, thanes, were really good, but they also raised. Uh, you know, thousands of people from the local countrysides, farmers and, you know, people that really didn't have, um, you know, professional warrior experience. And and then uh, during the battle, um, uh, Duke William the Conqueror's um, uh, deceptive tac tactic and deception's a big part of war, as you know, uh, was um, to uh, charge uh, the shield wall with the cavalry uh, and then get thrown back because the shield wall is really good and they've got spears and they've got shields and they're strong and they're pushing into each other's backs. And then, uh, though, uh, they turn around and, and feign uh, retreat, uh, feign uh, flight, feign being routed uh, by the shield wall. Now, the house carls were too disciplined to chase after them, but two thirds of that army was the feared, you know, just all the farmers and people that had been brought in from the country and they thought they'd won and they went running down the hill and then the cavalry just turned around and massacred them. And after that, um, they they won the battle because there weren't enough house, house carls left. Uh, well, how could that have gone differently? I suppose if, um, if um, the, um, uh, uh, somehow the, uh, King Harold hadn't had to march up to York to fight the uh, Harold Hardrada, the Norwegian king that invaded at the same time as William the Conqueror and barely made it down to Hastings in time to fight the second battle. Uh, maybe he could have done more training and planning and maybe you know part of the shield wall could have echeloned out to protect the feared and get them back so that they didn't go, all get slaughtered by the Normans and then they could have lived to fight another day. And then, um, we would not have had um, England become uh, Norman England. And uh, basically the whole history of England would have been completely different, more Germanic and less French. Uh, as it was, those two cultures then blended to become uh, the, um, the, 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 the English, uh, rather not the Saxons, not the Normans, the English. And, uh, and they uh, developed a, a great tactic, uh, which was again, kind of a, a, a blend that uh, both the Normans and the Saxons and the Danes have been very good at archery. And so the, the English bowmen prevailed in the battle of uh, Agincourt, uh, like four centuries late, uh, almost four centuries later, uh, King Henry V uh, uh, won that battle with only about five or 6,000 uh, infantry uh, versus, um, something like 20,000 mostly mounted knights or men at arms, mostly mounted. But um, the night before the battle, um, they planned out their tactics. And, and the one thing they had going for them was it rained heavily. So the, there was a lot of mud. And, and uh, they got the cavalry all bogged down in the mud and massacred them. If it had not rained, then... Um, you know, uh, uh, England would not have won the Battle of Agincourt and uh, they would have been kicked out of uh, France about 50 years earlier. And I don't know, maybe that would have changed uh, French history, uh, although maybe not as much as the uh, English uh, 
would have been changed uh, by a Norman defeat at Hastings or a stalemate or something. So that was interesting. I didn't really do the third one, um, the future war, um, but I'd really like to explore like, um, I don't know if you, you, you probably watch Star Wars and you, you've read different sci-fi novels and where they talk about battles of spaceships and you're really fighting in three dimensions instead of two. But I kind of don't know enough physics and enough, uh, uh, I don't even know what I don't know, but uh, you know, the, the whole, uh, uh, the whole geography is different when you're fighting in three dimensions instead of two, so to speak. Uh, so that, that's, I guess, I guess it's kind of like aerial combat. Um, so that, that could be very interesting, but what I really want to talk about though, is the, the trading exercise. I love the, uh, most important thing about trading uh, video. I, a lot of things kind of came together for me in that. Uh, I had um, uh, basically heard some of this before in the foundation course, and maybe some of the nightly podcasts, but it made me think uh, that one wants to have um, three different exit strategies, potentially during different life cycle stages of the same trade. Um, and then you name, I love the way you name the, um, you know, the personas in the trader's mind that take charge of those exit strategies, where of course uh, the fireman um, gets you to no lose, but plus dinner for two, or at least to a half hour loss or something, instead of a, uh, uh, you know, a minus one hour loss on most trades. Uh, and then the, uh, the reliever, uh, the mid-game reliever um, tries to get you about a half hour or three quarters of an hour instead of, uh, you know, pretty much a scratch. Um, and then the closer comes in and tries to get you almost your full two hour um, if you get that far or, or beyond. Uh, so I've kind of, um, you know, taken it to heart that, uh, you know, I kind of got that written into the rules I'm going to use. Um, to um, you know, uh, basically use two bar low trails um, for the fireman, and then uh, for the um, mid uh, the mid game reliever, um, that one will use a little different strategy. But when he gets to one R, uh, then I could um, tell Trade Station to do a half R profit trail. You know, particularly if I have to leave the trade unattended, that's really good. Um, and it also makes sure that I don't come back to no lose plus dinner per two again. And then uh, maybe implement something like the two R battle drill, you know, in the uh, wildly successful trades. Uh, which brings me to kind of my work in progress on trading. Uh, last week, uh, uh, in somewhat colorful terms, uh, Ken told me I needed to untangle my swing trading. Uh, and, um, and, and, um, uh, I really like that because it, you know, it, it made me think uh, uh, about, uh, yeah, I'm kind of the INTJ analyst thinker. Uh, you know, I've got to uh, kind of keep working and working on all these different systems and I kind of never get done. Um, but I need to make something happen here. Um, and I really appreciate being, um, you know, called out on the carpet on that, and uh, uh, and and that was good. And and I, I I'm really glad I reacted that way rather than just making a lot of excuses because I could have made excuses. I could have said, "Well, I'm doing Super Trader Awakening. I'm doing Peak 202. I'm doing Blueprint. I'm doing all these courses." You know, and 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 how am I going to uh, how am I going to get this done? But um, really, uh, I still can. You know, it just may take a little longer because of the multitasking, but um, there's a right way to do it, and which is to kind of focus. And then there's a tangled up way to do it, which is to, um, uh, Glenn had a really good analogy about this, that uh, we learn all these different trading systems, day trading, swing trading, uh, you know, technical analysis, fundamental analysis, uh, dragons and moving averages and all these other things. And it's like if you had Monopoly and Parcheesi and Backgammon and all these boards on the uh, floor, you don't want to pick up, uh, you know, 
backgammon board and try to play Monopoly on that or something. You have to focus on on one kind of thing. So I um, fortunately, I think I was starting to focus um, to untangle myself, as it were. Uh, I just want to say that on the swing side, swing trader side of thing, um, I had been um, doing um, simulator trades and trade station. And uh, even before I got the message last week, I had already decided I'm, I'm going to just dedicate $100 to this and trade with real money until I lose that hundred dollars and I won't care how much I, how many times I lose. I'll, I'll just try to make it go on as long as I can. And you know what, if I end up ending up $500 up instead of $100, then I can increase my R, you know, and, 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 and that could turn into, uh, you know, real money at some point. And the other side of that is just to, um, you know, do my trade framing, uh, you know, do my, uh, prepare, uh, uh, plan, prepare, execute, and assess uh, using the resources that's provided through the swing framing session um, and following the rules in trading plan I've already written. I've got all the pieces of this game together. You know, if I just play this game without bringing in other pieces uh, over and over again, I'll, uh, I'll get there. So I uh, hope. Oh. And I had uh, two profitable trades last week before the wedding. share a screen real quick. All right, let me know when you see that. Lesson slide for Twister. Not yet. That should be there in a second. Okay. On my side, side, it says you can see it. Can you see that? It just says Ken Law started screen sharing. Yeah, it may take a half a second to get there. Yeah. Well, I'm going to start talking to it. So the. There we go. Sometimes when I screen share in the middle of the session, it makes it collapse. Hey, so on the left hand side, the the Twister uh, lesson and the and the Fletcher stuff. So I was talking with him today, actually. And one of the things that comes out of his research with uh, fourth graders uh, is the idea that resilience comes from pushing on to your third or fourth choice of what to do in a tough situation. That the first thing that comes to your mind is the obvious one, and everybody figures that out. And if you're in a struggle, the other guy has already thought of that too. And maybe so maybe your idea doesn't work because he's accounted for that. Um and so the mindset, the resilient mindset that he generates with, with kids taking these courses is that, you know, you fall down six times, you get up seven. You try this. If that doesn't work, you try something else. Try something else. So one of the techniques that we've seen is uh, adopting a different point of view. And that's what this lesson really is about. Only you're looking at it from, uh, like, environmental conditions. My list of 
things on the left-hand side is really, it comes from the world of strategic planning in which you're trying to generate a broad, unique, widely separated states of nature where a bunch of variables come together and they cause a di really significantly different future. And in that kind of world, you're not trying to enumerate all the possibles, but you're just trying to get a sample of separate and distinct uh, states of nature in the future. And then you see how your plan would op operate there, and then you get a sense of the robustness of it. Well, this is not, and, and so his ideas about, you know, choose a different battle. So those are geared towards army guys, which is what that handbook is for. But we could just as easily have substituted, uh, imagine uh, five different styles of trader significantly different than yours. And there, imagine each or any of them on the other side of the trade from you. And it starts going in your favor or going in their favor. How do each of those guys respond? And then you start developing these potential storylines about what price could do. And the way we construct our trade frames and price ladders is that we're looking for not unreasonable moves in either direction. Where could it get to? Where would it maybe stop because of reasons? Uh, and, and we use a combination of statistics to port resistance to do that. And so all of those allow you to see potential futures so that you're not surprised by things that happen, but you've already thought about what your resilient response would be. If this happens, then I could do that. If that happens, I could do. So you're building up these contingencies, and it frees you from a belief in that any one of them is the way that it must go, or you're wrong. You know, It really just says there's so many ways out of the train station that you've got to be prepared to you know, shift tracks, uh, jump to a different train, whatever. So on the right-hand side, uh, that has turned out to be a pretty popular video. And it really is the essential idea of uh, changing the, um, the set of futures that are possible. By taking some of those things off the table, you just change the shape of possible futures. So when you get to no lose plus dinner for two, that's why I say that's the most important part of the trade, is that once you do that, you have taken certain possible psychological experiences off the table. Like you are not going to experience a catastrophic loss or an adverse move that makes you freeze and then you panic and then you don't do the exit and then you have a disaster and then a psychological meltdown and question your own identity and purpose in life and all that. So the no lose plus dinner for two is a psychological shift to a set of futures that are always in your favor, just don't know how much. And so that's that psychological shift is fundamentally different than what most traders are experiencing at all times in the trade. Every time in the trade, they're always worried about the impact of what they're going to lose or the dollar that they had and then they lose it. It's like, no, this one just simply says, uh, I've taken my risk out. I'm going to get paid for monitoring this science project. And, and I am less concerned now about the emotional content of dollars in hand that I lose because I'm going to have some set of rules that gets me out, but I don't give them extra extra power. So one of the one of the issues in financial neuroscience is that the dollar that you have that you've won on the trade and you start losing those, those have like three times the emotional impact uh, of the dollar that you never got, you know, or even of the dollar that you were starting to lose from your own money. But to have won and then start to lose those are especially painful, according to, um, you know, emotional uh, behavioral finance. So this shift to recognize that I've gotten my risk out and that it's simply, and I'm going to treat the rest of the trade simply as a science project 
in order to evaluate the rule set gives you two layers of protection against all the pain and suffering that other traders are experiencing. And that's why those itemized members of the team all have a role to play. And now you can really think about this as a team approach that, you know, I tell our guys, uh, if the other team scores a goal on us, that's not the goalie's fault. There was about seven things that had to happen against us for them to score a goal. Like, we had to lose possession of the ball. And then we had to lose the 50-50 battle to get the possession back. And then we had to not be able to stop them carrying it into our zone. And then we couldn't stop them from crossing the ball to the center. And then we couldn't stop their striker from getting possession of the ball. And then we couldn't stop him from getting a clear look at the goal. And we didn't force him to his weaker foot so that he was going to take a shot with his weaker foot. And we didn't block the shot. And then he didn't kick it right at the goalie. And he had to put it on goal. So all of those things had to string together before they can get a goal. And so what caused the goal to be scored? It was a combination of all those things. So the entire team gets scored on, not the goalie. And we have that sort of relentless mindset about how to approach the game. That what we're trying to do is always make it hard for them to do the next thing, to be hard to play against. And so when you move down into the true storytelling notes by focusing on defense first, what what I'm really doing there was I'm setting out my my roster is I'm taking a look at how the game can be played in all the different parts of the field. And I know that if they can't score, we're in the game. You know, we might get a chance and then we're going to finish it or we're going to get a penalty or it's going to be a tie or it's going to be a penalty kicks and we're going to win those. But we take care of that defensive side because you may not be a brilliant, creative player, uh, but in defense, you are anticipating and working harder than the other guy. And so they they can't outwork us. They might out-athleticize us here and there, but they got to do seven or eight. They got to win seven or eight challenges against a team that's that's devoted to outworking them together as a team. Uh, before they can score. So this lesson really is about trying to imagine all the little combinations of possible futures that come out of the trade or come out of the battle and realizing no matter what just happened, it could have happened a lot of different ways. And that as you keep those refreshed and and you start feeling the potentials of where price can go or where the battle can go, it, it allows you to not get fixated on the price and the feelings of the moment because there's always something that you can do imagining where the ball could go. I we have a you know, a saying like how many how many people are there on the field? Well there's twenty three. There's eleven on each side plus a a referee. How many of them have the ball at any one time? A maximum of one. So the team that wins generally, is the team that plays better without the ball. And that means that if you don't have the ball, you got 11 people on your team that are figuring out how to get the ball. Where could the ball go next? What can I do to improve my position against one of their players? That's all I got to do is I got to be in a better position for the loose ball, whatever happens, than the person I'm marking or the person that's in my space. So I should always be moving. What is it that I can do to improve my position and reduce risk and be ready to exploit opportunity? So that kind of relentless what if and seeing seeing the potentials as opposed to just ball watching is what makes you really hard to play against. And there were a number of years in our heydays with the the primetime team when uh, there were something like uh, seven or eight hundred teams in the local uh, competitive league, boys and girls of all ages at different levels. There were about 800 teams. And there were a couple years where our team had the fewest goals against of any team in any league, any age, boys or girls. I mean, there were seasons when 
we gave up zero goals or one goal. Now, we didn't always score a lot of goals, you know, because we, I mean, we are who we are. We scored our share. But we were just really hard to break down, and we never stopped playing defense. So as you look at that most important moment in the trade, it's one where you gain a um, uh, a dominant position psychologically, and you never let that go. You never lose money on a trade once you've gotten to no lose plus dinner for two and that will change your psychology because now it's just a matter of time if i can't lose on this trade then this might also be a trade i win big or not okay we'll see doesn't matter because if it's not this one it's another one as long as i am not losing and i'm I, you know no lose plus dinner for two is not just i'm gaining point two r I'm already 1.2 R to the good because I didn't take a full 1 R loss and I made 0.2. So that's a psychologically powerful position to be in. It's a position of confidence and relentless commitment to going forward. And, and it shifts the entire narrative onto one side of the field. Like you're never going to go visit that other one. And that is a psychologically addictive state to be in the sense of relief that comes from that you can only appreciate it when you've been in a lot of losing trades where once i had money in a winning trade and now i've lost money on it it's not until you've actually had that feeling so many yep. times that you get sick and tired of being sick and tired you just say i'm just going to be ruthless risk management i'm going to be relentless on defense and that's what wins championships you know, um, so that's the that's the essential element of this um, of this of this lesson for me, and why that video is uh, kind of compelling. And I and I wanted to share that too about what comes out of uh, Fletcher's research with the little kids, and that is that resonates very strongly with what we know from uh, childhood education. There's a lot of work being done on the difference between striving and thriving. Is that when you look at kids that are taught to strive, everything in their identity rests on whether or not they actually win that moment and each little competition until, and, and then the pressure to keep winning builds and builds and builds and builds as if life is nothing more than a series of never-ending victories. Well, that's not life. Life is really all about uh, trial and error and getting up and reversing. You know, when you're in, in challenging times, I mean, it, go, it can go either way. And it's the guy that has resilience and fallback positions and is prepared for the challenges of not getting your own way and can still keep moving. That's why the, um, the essential part of Fletcher's treatment for kids is having them, you know, generate clever ideas about what to do in a situation. Hey, I was invited to go to my best friend's birthday party, but our family, it turns out, now has a family event that we got to go to. Well, what can I do to go with my family, but also make my friend feel good? And so you give them that challenge and they come up with a couple things. Okay, if that didn't work, what could you do? What else can you do? Who else has ideas? And then they start getting into the joy of finding more things that you could do. But the real secret is, is it builds the mindset that's, well, don't be surprised if that didn't work because the world is tough. And what else could I do? So I, I'll just keep going on to the next thing. And you end up building resilience. And what you do is you move away from a mindset of striving for first time victory every time to one which treats this as a 12 round match or 15 rounds with the champ and what can I do to keep trying new things and just keep on going it's not the size of the dog in the fight it's the size of the fight in the dog in that sense and so resilience is what leads to 
a continuous commitment to curiosity and creativity and continuing to try and get up and go and gumption. Uh, and that leads to thriving instead of just striving. The, uh, the movie In Search of Bobby Fischer talks about some little kid that ended up playing at, uh, you know, he was an international master uh, by the time he was 9 or 10. Uh, the rest of his story is actually pretty interesting. After that movie, he just decided he didn't want to do competitive chess anymore. And he ended up getting into Tai Chi and then competitive Tai Chi, which is almost a misnomer, but push hands Tai Chi, where you're using Tai Chi movements and you're trying to just induce the other guy to lose balance. And it's pretty competitive. Well, he became a world-class competitor in that discipline as well. And so he wrote a book about learning and resilience and thriving uh, that was pretty well done because he had experienced that exact phenomenon in more than one discipline in widely separated. And that's kind of unusual to end up being a world-class talent in such diverse uh, skill sets. Uh, I'll remember his name eventually, but, uh, but it's a kid who did uh, In Search of Bobby Fischer. He was, the, he was the subject of that movie. But so the whole point is that the Fletcher exercises are geared for military officers who were trying to get them to think about different ways the battle might could go so that you don't get complacent because you want to trade or you want to battle. Well, I'll just keep doing that because that's obviously what you do. No, the other guy's studying that. And so you got to be relentlessly searching um, for new possibilities. So that's what comes out of this, um, out of this lesson uh, for me. And, uh, you know, part of what I, uh, I started off my little story in the check-in about was, was being able to get out of the frame where I was just, you know, trying to compete to write a, as good a story as my buddy in Denmark. I just said, look, I, I got to tell stories to kids about what I've learned from 45 years of talking with sergeants. Well, that became very easy to write. That's all I had to do. So that shift uh, into a different trade frame or story frame uh, made all the difference of getting through it. And then I just said, well, okay. Uh, that's the story I got in me, so it's, it's genuine and true. So off we go. And uh, that's what the doctor ordered. So that's everything I got on that one. So uh, aho. And uh, uh, what I want to do is uh, 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 is get your keywords and then uh, release the hounds, let you get ready for the nightly podcast. And uh, I got to upload uh, uh, Luke's video to the lesson. It'll be one. It'll be a downloadable lesson in the same folder uh, that I post this this session. It'll be it'll be attached in there as well, unless I can figure out how to drop it into the and make one combined video. I'll probably, I'll see what I can do. All right, so aho, and uh, I'll be listening for your word uh, after these tones. So here we go. to say sustainability. Dan? Well, I know it's two, but I'm going to say resilient defense. Uh, mine is a, it's a hyphenated word, good enough. <laughs> it's good enough. All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and move us into uh, coffee talk. <laughs>